In the previous episode in this series, we talked about the events that happened after the assassination of Caesar, but the series itself is about the civil wars that continued shaking the Roman Republic, leading to the Principate. Unlike Caesar's civil war that began with a clear act of war, the crossing of the Rubicon, the civil war that would later be called the War of Mutina began slowly, with a number of events slowly pushing the relevant parties closer and closer to bloodshed. In this episode, we will talk about this first post-Caesar civil war. Although the Romans spoke the same language, the misunderstandings among them led to many bad things. The sponsor of this video, Babbel, is here to help you avoid conversational problems, as it's a great platform to learn a new language. A number of Kings and Generals team members used Babbel in the last year to learn a new language for travel, or to impress their loved ones, or to be able to research sources in various languages, as Babbel offers Spanish, French, Russian, Turkish, Italian, Portuguese, and other languages spoken by more than 2 billion people worldwide. Babbel has more than 10 million subscribers, and for a good reason, it teaches using real-world practical conversations about travel, business, and relationships in short 10-minute interactive lessons lessons, making it a perfect service for people with time constraints. Lessons are designed by real language teachers and no machine learning algorithms or AI. Babbel's award-winning technique is proven to get you speaking a new language in just three weeks, and there are multiple ways to learn, including podcasts, games, videos, and live classes with professional teachers. Babbel is so sure that it works that it offers a 20-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Join us and millions of others and learn a new language with Babbel. This sponsorship supports our channel and you can do the same by subscribing to Babbel via the link in the description to get 65% off the subscription. By the summer of 44 BC, Octavian had successfully halted Brutus and Cassius's plan to win over the Roman public, forcing them to abandon the city. Brutus had retreated to Greece, where he was greeted warmly in Athens and began rallying support, while Cassius was en route to the east, where he held the most influence. Antony and Dolabella, the two consuls for the year, had been assigned Macedonia and Syria respectively for the following year, but their position was somewhat weak. The public in Rome was starting to turn against them and they had no significant army under their command. Dolabella had been granted command of the legions Caesar had picked out for the Parthian campaign, currently in Illyria, but this command would not take effect until the end of his consulship at the end of the year. They needed men now. Suddenly, a rumour reached Rome that a huge Getae force had attacked Macedonia. Antony immediately requested that the Parthian army be put under his command to defend the province. The Senate was initially reluctant, but not wanting to risk the province, relented. Soon it was reported that the Getae were no longer in Macedonia, and some reports claimed that they never even attacked. Nevertheless, Antony insisted that he maintain command, claiming that if the army were moved, then there would certainly be a huge attack on the undefended province. Antony had just secured himself a large and well-trained army consisting of Caesar's veterans. Antony immediately brought four legions to Brandisium and demanded that the Senate reassign governance of Macedonia to his brother Gaius, while he was to be given governance of Cisalpine Gaul. Just as Caesar before him, Antony knew he had to secure governance of a province in order to have legal immunity. Moreover, Caesar had shown how valuable the province was and how much control the governor of Cisalpine Gaul could exercise over Rome. Decimus Brutus was currently the governor, however, and the Senate refused to allow Antony to replace him. Looking to bypass the Senate, Antony planned to put the law to the public assembly, but with his popularity greatly diminished, he was unlikely to pass the law alone. The most popular man in Rome at the moment was Octavian. The two men had constantly been at loggerheads, but Antony's circle had been advising him to reconcile. Finally seeing the benefit in this, Antony and Octavian made a temporary alliance. Octavian would swing the vote in the assembly, while Antony would later help Octavian. Still bitter towards Antony, Octavian was even more resentful of Decimus and was willing to do what was necessary to weaken Caesar's assassins. 
The law was passed by the people, ensuring Antony would be governor of Cisalpine Gaul and his brother governor of Macedonia for 43 BC. The Senate, however, sent messages to Decimus to not give in to Antony and to defend his province. Meanwhile, Sextus Pompey had ventured out from his base in Sicily and had managed to stir up a revolt in Spain, which had always had Pompeian sympathies. Lepidus, previously Caesar's master of horse, was able to negotiate with Sextus to retreat without fighting, and the Senate praised him for that, as winning over Lepidus would greatly strengthen their position and severely undermine Antony. In Rome, one of the tribunes of the plebs died and needed to be replaced. Octavian was the popular candidate, but the Senate feared that he would use his office to prosecute the liberators. Octavian turned to Antony, calling to repay the favor, but the latter refused, claiming that Octavian was too young. The majority voted for Octavian nonetheless, but Antony once again interceded, annulling the vote. Octavian was furious and immediately began sending his agents throughout Italy, gauging which cities would be loyal to him and which of Antony's legions had wavering loyalty, and amassing old veterans of Caesar. To further damage Antony's position, Octavian's ally Cicero began disseminating the first of a number of speeches attacking Antony's actions and character, the Philippics. Octavian's agents were successful in sowing discontent among legions in Brundisium, as many legionaries saw Antony's actions against Caesar's heir as disrespectful and insulting. Immediately Antony rushed to Brundisium to regain control of the situation. Octavian, nervous of what Antony was planning, also left Rome, calling Caesarian veterans to his banner. He offered huge rewards and soon had an army of thousands. With no legal right to command an army, he justified it by calling them his bodyguards. He sent this force to Aretium and then started waiting for Antony to make the first move. In Brundisium, Antony was struggling to regain control. Octavian's agents had been effective, and Antony's initial gift of 100 drachmae was laughed off. Infuriated, Antony rounded up the ringleaders and decimated them. This brutal action, combined with a larger offered reward, was enough to temporarily win the legions back to his side, and Antony returned to Rome, sending the four legions north to Arminium, joining with two more on the road. However, while on the march, two other Macedonian legions, the Marcian and Fourth, consisting of Caesar's veterans, defected, pledging their loyalties to Octavian. Antony tried to win them back, but was forced away by arrow fire. Nevertheless, at this point in late November, Antony was in a solid position. He had four legions in Italy, Lepidus and Asinius Pollio in Spain commanded four and three legions respectively, and Plancus commanded another three in Transalpine Gaul. Antony was confident that they would side with him. Meanwhile, Dolabella had also begun his journey from Rome to Syria, collecting a small force, likely from Macedonia, to take up governorship there when his term as consul ended. En route he passed through Asia, the province governed by Trebonius. While attempting to resupply, Dolabella found all the cities closed to him. Furious, he attacked Smyrna, where Trebonius was located, but was unsuccessful. Disgruntled, he began to retreat and was shadowed by Trebonius's men. Dolabella's scouts informed him of this though, and he managed to lay an ambush, destroying Trebonius's force and rushing back to seize the now undefended Smyrna. Trebonius was captured in his bed and beheaded by Dolabella's men, the first of Caesar's assassins to die. With the year coming to a close, Dolabella and Antony's terms as consul would also be ending soon. Antony, knowing he needed to secure a governorship, sent messages to Decimus, demanding that he give up his province, demands that Decimus refused. Antony then left Rome to join his army to enforce his claim on the province and was given a fabulous send-off by the Senate. Octavian, outraged at Antony's earlier betrayal, also left Rome to join with his force in Aretium. He now also had a formidable force, 
effectively two legions of veterans and two of levies who had rallied to him, and the Marcin and Fourth Legions. He too received a warm send-off from the Senate, which hoped that the two Caesareans would wear each other down. Antony, marching to Cisalpine Gaul, once again demanded Decimus's resignation, and Decimus once again refused. Antony entered the province and began marching on various towns, many of which simply opened their gates to him, not wanting to be sacked. Decimus, however, had three legions, two made up of veterans, and a sizable force of gladiators. He marched to Mutina and prepared to defend the city. Antony arrived shortly, besieging the city and encircling it with walls, just as Caesar had done at Alicia. 44 BC had come to an end, and new consuls were elected in Rome, Hittius and Pansa. Both men had served under Caesar, but both were somewhat moderate Caesarians, convinced by Cicero of the danger that Antony presented. Cicero was doubling down on his attacks against Antony, and in an impassioned speech in the Senate, called for Antony to be declared an enemy of the people. In an equally impressive speech, Caesar's father-in-law, Lucius Calpurnius Piso, who had been trying to decrease the tensions during the last decade of wars, defended Antony, insisting that his crimes were not enough to be declared an enemy of the state, and advocating for Antony to stand trial. Despite Cicero's attempts, the Senate initially attempted to negotiate, offering him the governorship of Macedonia, but Antony was having none of it, citing the vote of the People's Assembly. Antony's rejection played into Cicero's hands perfectly, and he convinced the Senate to declare both Antony and Dolabella enemies of the state. At the same time, Cicero ensured that Octavian had the legal right to command armies under the Senate, assigning him to assist Hirtius and Panzer, who had been instructed to raise troops to fight Antony. Lastly, Brutus and Cassius were both confirmed as governors of Macedonia and Syria, with all governors east of the Adriatic being instructed to assist them in any way they could. It was a masterful play that returned the power to the Senate with consuls sympathetic to their cause, a large army in Italy and the east secured. Brutus and Cassius were quick to seize the moment. Brutus, having rallied support in Greece throughout 44 BC, marched into Macedonia, seizing it and capturing Antony's brother Gaius. Meanwhile, Cassius had leveraged his incredible popularity in the east, a result of his heroic conduct in Crassus's otherwise disastrous Carre campaign. With the Senate having assigned all eastern governors to assist him and Brutus, Cassius had managed to gather a huge force of 12 legions and march to Syria, confronting Dolabella at Laodicea. He easily captured the town, Dolabella committing suicide with the assistance of his soldiers. Antony's position was now perilous, but Octavian too was nervous, as despite the Imperium to command armies, he was still outranked and subservient to the new consuls, who could easily remove him from his command. His primary motivation was to destroy the Liberators and the Pompeians, but it now seemed that the Pompeian faction had been revived and was in power. Still thinking that his best chances lay with the Senate, Octavian continued to assist the two consuls. Pansa was still levying legions, but Hirtius joined Octavian, taking command of the two ex-Antonine legions. With winter closing in and Decimus running low on supplies, the two marched to his position to put pressure on Antony. Given the quality of Antony's army, however, they were apprehensive to commit to a battle, preferring to skirmish while they waited for Pansa's arrival. Meanwhile in Rome, Cicero was effectively in charge, pursuing a stringent anti-Antony policy by extracting heavy taxes from Antony's allies to raise war funds. However, he went too far, pushing one of them, Ventidius, to rally three legions worth of veterans. With this force, he tried to make his way to Antony, but finding the road blocked by Octavian and Hirtius, diverted to Picanum to bide his time. Meanwhile, Pansa, having recently levied four new legions, marched to Octavian and Hirtius in late March of 43 BC. Antony, 
upon hearing this and fearing that he would soon be massively outnumbered, decided to try and defeat his enemies in detail, leading two of his veteran legions, the 2nd and 35th, a few cohorts of his picked bodyguard, and a significant number of cavalry between Octavian and Hirtius's armies, Antony marched to the Via Amelia, positioning themselves near the Forum Galorum, just outside the marshes, ready to ambush Pansa. He also sent smaller forces under his brother Lucius to harass Octavian's camp, keeping him pinned inside. Fortunately for Pansa, both Hirtius and Octavian had been cautious. Hirtius sending the veteran Martian legion under Galba, one of Caesar's assassins, and Octavian sending two cohorts of his bodyguard to escort the new levies. It was a wise move. As Panzer's force marched through the marsh, they were harassed by some of Antony's cavalry. The Martian legion and Octavian's bodyguard advanced to chase them from the levies. On the 14th of April, as they made it out of the marshes onto open ground, they deployed in a line, but were suddenly attacked by Antony's main force. It was a cunning move. With the Martian legion deployed in line in front of the marshes, they had effectively blocked the road from the marshes, preventing the levies from joining them. The bodyguards of Antony and Octavian, both in the respective center of their armies, engaged, while the Martian legion, split in two on either flank, engaged the 2nd and 35th. The officers of the Martian legion, worried that the levies would simply cause confusion and break the battle line, ordered them to retreat back to their camp. Appian's description of the battle is harrowing. The three legions that were engaged were all veterans who had fought under Caesar, and the two sides bitterly resented each other, seeing their opponents as traitors. According to Appian, the battle was fought in near silence, only broken by groans of pain and the clash of weapons. There were no war cries, the veterans on both sides knowing that this would do little to intimidate their enemies. The left wing of the Martian legion began to give ground, but the right flank was having more success, pushing back the 35th legion. As they did, however, Antony's cavalry managed to get around their flanks. Now surrounded, the Martian legion began giving ground, Pansa being wounded in the fighting and rushed back to the camp of the levies. Octavian's bodyguard, fighting to the last man, was destroyed in the center. The Martian legion continued to give ground, but as they did, they became entangled with some of the levies still trying to retreat down the narrow road back to the camp. Panzer's force took heavy losses in this withdrawal, but the remnants of the Martian legion were able to finally reach the safety of the fort. Antony, not willing to waste time on a prolonged siege of the fortified position, pulled back. It was initially a victory for Antony, having destroyed the cohorts of Octavian's bodyguard and inflicting heavy casualties on the Martian and Levy legions, including injuring a consul. He began his march back to Mutina in triumph. As he did, however, he was attacked by Hirtius and the 4th legion. Antony's men, utterly exhausted from the battle and march, fought as well as they could, but fatigued as they were, failed to stop Hirtius's army from overrunning them, forcing Antony to retreat hastily to Mutina. By the end of the day, Antony had lost almost half of the two legions, including the eagles. His victory in the morning had turned into a bitter defeat in the afternoon. In Rome, the victory was hailed as decisive, particularly by Cicero. However, Antony was not done yet, his forces around Mutina still maintaining the siege of Decimus. Octavian and Hirtius, just days after the Battle of Forum Galorum, marched on Antony's position, determined to finally break the siege. Antony's position was well defended, but Octavian and Hirtius spotted a point where the terrain had made it difficult for the defences to be properly built. They focused their force on this point, attempting to break through. Initially, Antony was reluctant to face them head on, hoping to still them with his defences and harass them with cavalry. Soon, however, it became apparent that Octavian and Hirtius's men would eventually break through if something was not done. Still reluctant to completely abandon the siege, Antony marched out two legions to confront his enemies on the 21st of April. Octavian and Hirtius immediately changed their focus from the defences to these two legions. 
Octavian's force slowly gained the upper hand, pushing back Antony's legions. Desperately, Antony tried to move other legions to assist, but having been deployed all around the city, many were too far to assist. Antony's two legions were struggling, and Hirtius was even able to lead a legion into Antony's camp, attempting to fight his way through to Antony's tent. The camp was defended by Antony's elite 5th legion, however, and the fighting was brutal. Simultaneously, Decimus managed to organize a sortie under Aquila, another of Caesar's assassins. Fighting now raged all around the city, Aquila's force attacking Antony's defenses from the outside, Hirtius against the 5th inside of Antony's camp, and Octavian outside the camp against two of Antony's legions. Octavian's men finally managed to completely break their opponents and rush to Hirtius's aid. At this point, Hirtius was killed in the fighting. The circumstances of his death are not clear. Appian says that Octavian fought in the front line bravely to reclaim his body, while other sources, like Suetonius and Niger, say that Octavian had Hirtius killed in the fighting. Whatever the truth, the consul was dead and Octavian pulled his men back the 5th legion having successfully defended Antony's camp. Aquila had also died in the fighting and the sortie was repulsed. Antony, realizing that he now did not have the numbers to continue the siege, abandoned his position in the night, making for Picanum to consolidate with Vitidius. It was a somewhat indecisive action. While Octavian's force had managed to inflict more casualties, they had failed in the primary objectives Antony was still alive and had managed to escape. Shortly afterwards, Pansa, the consul wounded at Forum Galorum, also died of his wounds. His death, too, is mysterious. Appian describes a moving meeting between Octavian and Pansa on the consul's deathbed, where the consul revealed that he had been rooting for Octavian from the start and bestowed command of the army to him. Suetonius and Tacitus, on the other hand, suggest that Pansa may have been poisoned, possibly on Octavian's orders. Both consuls were lauded as heroes by Cicero, who gave Octavian very little credit for any of his actions. It was ordered that Decimus be given full command of the legions. Octavian was outraged. He had been used as a pawn by the Senate time and time again, and finally had enough. He refused to give up command of the legions to Decimus, insisting that his men would not follow the assassin of Caesar. When Decimus gave him orders to cut off Antony and prevent him from merging with Vitidius, Octavian refused. It was a turning point in history. Secretly, he sent messages to Lepidus, Plancus and Pollio, insisting that they needed to work together as Caesareans to counter the growing Pompeian faction. In the weeks following Mutina, these three had, after discussions with Antony, merged with him, bringing his force to a colossal 17 legions. The battles and deaths of the two consuls had left a power vacuum in Rome. Brutus and Cassius, with the support of the Senate, had amassed their power in the east, reviving the Pompeian faction. In the west, Antony and Lepidus's alliance had effectively rebuilt the Caesarian faction. Caught between the two was Octavian, alienated by the Senate and still resentful of Antony. In our next episode, we shall cover how this power vacuum was resolved and how the civil war in Italy would spiral into a civil war across the Roman world. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.